Hi and welcome to Body Stories. In today's episode we are talking with body positive personal trainer and fitness instructor Mel Williams. Mel adopts a health every size approach to her work and she is the founder of Body Positive Cornwall, a support group which helps women to cultivate body acceptance and confidence through workshops either in person or online. How she's overcome her eating disorder and how her success as a gig rower, and we mean big success as a gig rower, has been instrumental in learning to respect and care for her body and acknowledge the remarkable things it can do. Hey Mel, thanks for joining us today. Um, If you could just tell the club a little bit about yourself, what you do and who you are. Uh, okay, uh, gosh, I don't know where to start. Um, I suppose my name's Mal, I'm 44 years old. Um, I'm divorced with three children. I have a 19-year-old, a 16-year-old and a four-year-old. Um, I'm a fitness instructor and um, I suppose personal trainer. I work at Fitness Wild and I also have my little business um, called Move by Fitness, which um, works with gig growers and the elderly. And then I also have a little side project called Body Positive Cornwall, which um, at the moment is just like a little support group for anyone uh, who is interested in body positivity and getting out of this body eating and diet culture. And also run, as part of that, I run body positive workshops as well. Amazing. You brushed over the gig growing there, uh, Mel, but I know you're what, five times world champion? Oh yeah. I think it's four actually, Jimmy. Uh, Thank was, you. Yeah, yeah, four so, yeah you know, sorry. Champion, Mel, you know, I've missed that. Four times world <laughs> champion in. I got a bit of a lag. In in uh, in the very obscure uh, Cornish sport growing. So it's a bit like if you think of the Scottish Highland sports, it's like the Cornish equivalent of that gig rowing. It's oh like a sort God, of traditional um, rowing, ocean rowing boat. And it used to be like an old um, uh, kind of used as a lifeboat down in Cornwall in the Isles of Scilly, and um, it's about thirty-two foot long. Um, and it's um, yeah, the oars are huge. Actually, everyone you can see one is one up in my living room. You can see. Um, oh, I'm trying to follow it round. You can't. Oh yeah, uh, uh, that's what it looks like. <laughs> and um, they're very heavy, so it really helps to be big and strong and tall. And um, yeah, they used to. Um, uh, they used to have pilots on board. So if a ship came in, say with a tea or goods on it from um, the Americas or China, and the first piece of land it would often hit would be Cornwall or the Isles of Scilly. And they'd need a pilot to go on board. So um, these these uh, guys would jump in a gig and row out and to the sailing ship and put a pilot on board. And it was a bit of a race to who could get the job. So they would often row really hard and really fast because they wanted to get the boat first. And then that became a sport. And um, they used to do it in the summer in regattas and things. And it's still going on today. It's a, how do you find gig row? Because um, I'm sure we'll get into this a bit more later, but it seems like a good time to bring it up. Um, we spoke very briefly at the start of this about intuitive movement. So finding exercises you enjoy. Um, and not doing it from a, a place of punishment, doing it because you you enjoy doing it, you want to get out and be part of like a, a gig growing team. How did you find gig growing? Obviously, Cornwall's quite niche for it. Being really tall and big, I mean, by the time I was 14, I was 5 foot 11 and I had size nine and a half feet. And it was really tough being such a big woman and taking up so much space. And I wasn't sporty. I was really hopeless at ball sports and things like that. But I did quite like athletics. I quite like um, the hurdles and high jump and running and, and, and cross country running. And um, But what happened when I was about 14, 15, I just got the most enormous bazimbas, Jimmy. <laughs> like, um, and it was like really, <laughs> yeah, they were like, woo. And uh, and I lived in um, North Wales where everyone is like like yay high, and so my boobs are like at basically eye level to everyone, and I just suddenly became really <laughs> intensely self conscious about these boobs, and so I shied away from. I made excuses. I used to forge my mum's um, handwriting to write letters to get out of PE. I just found just my body was just too big, and then I felt like I took up so much space. I was really clumsy, and I just felt so shy. So that was the end of sport for me, really. And it's a shame because you know if I'd had access to rowing then at that age or had a mentor or someone sporty in my family that kind of would took me under their wing I like my life could have taken a different direction entirely but um what happened was I ended up moving to London when I was 16 and um yeah and still carried on not being involved with sport at all um and then when I became a single parent in London I decided to move down to Cornwall which I actually come down here sailing before with friends 
And actually, funnily enough, it was sailing before rowing because when I came down to Cornwall and I started sailing on traditional old Cornish boats, which have these huge masts, which are like this fat and made of wood, they're like telegraph poles. And the sails are enormous, these old Cornish luggers. And I got involved in sailing in those going to Brittany. And um, I actually hitched down from London, which when I think about it now, I'm like, I can't believe I did that. I must have been about 18, 19. I used to hitch down and I go sailing. And what was really great was that sailing was like, it's really physical and um, being really tall and big and strong. It was the first time I ever felt like, wow, actually pulling up a massive sail like by myself I got a lot of kudos from the guys they were like wow you know you can make the tea and cook and you can like pull up an anchor like being strong and on a classic um old sailing boat is a really great thing and and then also so when I moved down here this is a really long-winded answer to your question <laughs> someone said do you want to try gig rowing I was like I actually had quite a bad back and I was like probably from doing too much like body pump and stuff because I had started going to the gym a little bit after I had my daughter but um I was like, oh no my back's probably not gonna you know you have one or it's a massive big heavy or and I was like oh I'm not sure about this but I absolutely loved it and it was being out in the water my back was fine just amazing it's really nice healthy way to exercise but and I think being a rower it's really common for rowers if you speak to a lot of the Olympic rowers they'll often tell you they were rubbish at PE they were really because they're so big and like really clumsy when you're in that awkward teenage phase um but no yeah it was brilliant and then on from the gig rowing, then someone said to me, you should try and go into competing. And I was like, oh, no, that's like, that sounds sporty, like no way. And then um, I was just thought, well, I'll give it a go. And I got on the rowing machine. And I do what all the blokes do at the gym, gym. And I wrapped it up to 10. And I would sit on the rower, on the rowing machine in the gym and do 10K and get off it. And I go, up. Oh, that was all right. That felt like a gig. And I did that quite a few times. And then someone said to me, do you want to do a 2K rowing test and to see if you can get into the ladies squad to compete? And I was like, yeah, okay. And I got on the rower and I got, I did 2000 metres in a time that beat most of uh, the current A crew at the time. And I just jumped off the air. I was like, okay, yeah, bye. God, that was horrible. Bye. Off you go. And everyone was like, do you know what you've just done? <laughs> you've just beaten like nearly the whole way. Really? And then they said, right, we're going to put you in. We want to train you up to row and get you as much rowing practice as possible. So then I went into the ladies B crew, did a, um, went to ladies B crew. And then from the B crew, went into the A crew. And um, I've just absolutely loved it. And to be, for me, being... All those years that I spent really hating my body mm. and really never knowing what was possible. When I when I won my first world championships and we crossed the line, it was like, just couldn't believe it. I was like, I would never, ever, ever have guessed that I would have been doing anything like that. When I, if I could have told my 16-year-old self, like big, blaggy black jumpers and, you know, covering myself up and I just say, no, I don't do anything physical. If I could have told that person, you're going to be a world champion rower one day, I just wouldn't have believed it. How have you found then, having found a sport that you love and enjoy and having gone from being um, very body aware, how do you think finding a form of movement that you love and you're passionate about has actually changed your relationship with your body? It's absolutely transformed it, um, Rosie. It's just um, been incredible. I think I'm so much more focused now on on what my body can do and what it can achieve. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think... I still struggle sometimes having to put rowing kit on because I've had three children, um, you know, and I've got sort of sometimes a bit of a tummy and I have um, a condition called endometriosis as well. So sometimes Mm -hmm. around my period, I get really bloated. So sometimes putting on my rowing kit and going out to row and sometimes, especially when I know people are going to be taking photographs, I sometimes do feel a bit still body aware, but also now more recently, I've come to be more, actually, I want to set an example. I want to show actually that women who've had children can still achieve things in sport and still enjoy this kind of this you know I don't I want to be you know rather um set an example rather than than hide away and be ashamed of ashamed of that on that subject you know you're a mum you're a mum of three I'm a mum of three um I heard you've got daughter daughters have you got uh yeah I've got um well, I've actually got a four-year-old son a 16-year-old daughter and a 19-year-old trans transgender son actually that's something oh, wow. you know I'd love to get your view on is how we talk about bodies to the next generation how we talk about our um ourselves our, our body our body awareness how have you found your journey has changed like the conversations you have with your, your children now um yeah really different it's probably three really different things that come up for me there the first one is the way that my mum talked about her body and the way she talked to me about my body mm-hmm. was so like damaging when I look back my mum 
I just have constant memories of my mum looking in the mirror saying, I look fat, I look disgusting, my tummy's so big. She had really bad fibroids and problems with her womb as well. So she often had a lot of bloating. So she would be like, oh, my tummy's so disgusting. I mean, I can just hear her now. Like it was just relentless all my whole childhood. And then about my body, she really struggled with me being really big because I'm like the tallest in my family. And she would say really worry that literally genuinely worry that no one was going to marry me because I was so big. And she would really struggle to like get clothes to me. She would buy me clothes that were like huge, like she, in her in my her mind. I think I was a lot bigger than I was, so that kind of didn't help. And then so I was quite determined when I had children that I wasn't. I was quite careful not to say things in front of them and things like that. But when the girls were small, um, I was definitely quite in a lot of disordered eating. I was studying to be a nutritional therapist. I was very food, you know, I was bulimic. I was over exercising. I remember my oldest, I said, right, no sugar, you're not having any biscuits or cakes or anything like that. No, you know, my child isn't having any of that. And actually, I remember what was a turning point for me was um, we were at a birthday party and she stole a biscuit when she was about two and ran off into a corner and was like eating it in the corner, like with her back to everyone, like hiding. this. And I was like, actually, I realised then that was quite damaging. So I kind of let go of that a little bit. But I'm also I'm very conscious of when I was in that disordered eating phase, they picked up a lot of diet talk from me and food stuff recently in the last five six years I'm hoping that I've undone a lot of that damage Mm. by talking to them a lot about body positivity teaching them as much as I can really focusing on what their bodies can do really trying to get them to say say my main message to them is that you are more than your body like you've got these amazing brains you've got amazing talents like my oldest two are amazing artists you know like you you know you're so much you've got so much more to offer than your appearance and that's that's what I teach them now. I was going to say what would you say the most important thing is then to keep in mind in for, for the club members in regards to keeping a healthy relationship with food going on with you? For a healthy relationship with food what's the most important thing? Um, I think probably gosh it's quite a difficult question I think it's probably self-awareness I think um, my relationship with food has just become so much better just with self-awareness like doing work on myself away from food actually working on the problems in my life that need working on because often stuff with food I think shows up obsession with food and your appearance is often a way that people um, try and control something when actually there's things going on in their lives they don't have any control about or they're not dealing with and they're not finding the courage to take important steps um, maybe coming out of an unhappy relationship or giving up um leaving a job they're not happy in and I think I think the secret to having a good relationship healthy relationship with food is to almost like look at other areas of your life what you can change and control I think there is something there's definitely something around you know we use food food is something we can very easily control at a point in time when other things go out of control and there's a really good analogy about we can use um body bashing or the control of food a bit like the comfy pair of jogging bottoms we put on at the end of the day mm-hmm. and you get to the end of the day and you put it on you say oh, I I'm either going to control this or I'm going to blame this because it's easier to do that than confront some of those kind of like bigger issues as other areas yeah. that need work isn't it yeah for sure and I think when I think of the times that when my body dysmorphia and my bulimia is at its worst it was when my life was at its messiest and there was so much to deal with that I wasn't dealing with and um yeah, and, and it was in dealing with all the things, the big problems in my life that's really gone hand in hand with getting a much healthier and better relationship with, with food and, and my body. How do you use that approach now? So everything you've learned, you know, you're running your body positivity support group. How has is, how is that all come about? How has your journey informed the work you do now then? It was probably when I moved down to Cornwall and I was recovering from my eating disorder, um, I was just finding um, it just yeah really hard to stay like to stay well when you're getting all these messages all the time telling you you should be thinner you know you should be um fitter you should be eating really healthily and I think you're constantly getting bombarded in London you get a lot more advertising bombarded at you wherever you go but in Cornwall you get you get a lot less and I quite it was quite nice to have a bit of a rest from that but I think it was probably when I had my third child, um, Dougie, when after I had him, I did CrossFit all the way through my pregnancy, which I absolutely loved. But when I came back to it after I'd had Dougie, I felt a lot of pressure on me to get my body back. And I was like, OK, I'm 40. I just had a baby at 40. Like I, it's going to be like, you know, that's a lot of pressure to put on myself to get back into having the body that I had before at 40. 
Um, and I was really trying to resist. I made a promise to myself that I was going to be really, really kind. And I wasn't going to do that to myself. I wasn't going to be that. Un- it's that unkind, really. You can still have a crawl, you know, you just had a baby. And then, you know, you're going to put all that pressure on yourself. So I was just going to cross it. I was getting back into exercise. But I found even just being in that environment, it was just around me all the time. The diet talk, the wow, you know, you're looking great. You're losing weight every time we see you you're looking smaller. And I was starting to kind of question this. I was like, I'm finding this really hard. Um, it was only until um, someone in Truro put on a, a film called Embrace by Taryn Brumfit. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah, they put it on in Truro. It's brilliant. I just actually had viral meningitis. I was really poorly. And um, I was, I've, I'd literally lost two weeks of my life. I'd actually lost quite a bit of weight because I, I don't know if you've ever had viral meningitis. It's horrible. And um, I was, I went in my pajamas. I was so determined to see this film with some friends, and it tra- it just blew my mind. It was amazing. It was so so good. And it's all about just celebrating your body and letting go of diet culture. And it, that was the first time really I got introduced to body positivity, and I was like, wow, brilliant. And then literally like a few days later, as I was feeling a bit better, I thought I'll go back to the gym. And I went back to the gym, and everyone was like, oh my god, you look amazing. You've just lost so much weight. You look incredible. You don't even look like you've had a baby. And I was like. I've just been really ill I've lost like two weeks of my life and that to me just felt really messed up I was like Mm. and I just I think it was a real turning point for me and then I think after that I just didn't have the stomach anymore to um yeah I just I don't know I kind of something really really profoundly changed me I said right it's actually really really hard and what I need to work on is just being resilient to all of those messages that are coming at me all the time so I just started following um, lots of body positive people on Instagram and Facebook. And I started to unfollow all the fitspo and all the fitspiration stuff that was making me feel really crap about my body. And actually what happened, it just transformed how I see women. It transformed how I see fat. It transformed how I feel about myself. I think I realized I was deeply fat phobic. And mm. I think that's what's come out of what I see now in our culture there's so much fat phobia and we judge people on their appearance just like that you know in an instant mm-hmm. we judge someone and I've really unraveled all of that in myself and then once I sort of done all that I could see it everywhere and I could see so many women and making themselves so unhappy because they are like they've had the same conditioning as me yeah. so I decided right I'm going to do something about it actually a friend a counsellor actually um Maliki from Lifetime Therapy he really pushed me into it he said, you've got to do a workshop, you've got to do a workshop. And I was like, no, 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 I'm terrified of doing that, no way. And then actually he kind of basically bullied me into doing one and at his place in Truro, and it actually just went so well and it just transformed the women who came. And the thing is, look, you can't do it in half an hour. You've got to take people on a journey and it is a bit of a journey. Um, so I do it often. I've said, people have said, can you just come and do a talk on body positivity? And I'm like, it doesn't really work. It's a massive subject. So I mm-hmm. kind of, yeah on my workshops take people on a bit of a journey and and it's amazing like the feedback I've had is like things like I think that's one of the second ones I did there was a really amazing girl who literally in a in the lunch break went out down to Primark and bought like five pairs of shorts because she hadn't worn shorts for like 10 years because she was so embarrassed ashamed of the cellulite on her legs and literally in the lunch break she went out and bought loads of shorts I've had women tell me they have like a better sex life because they're like they're having you know they're not so they feel yeah. freer in their bodies and not so embarrassed you know with the lights on and you know, I think, <laughs> so. you know it's really important that we do one check our internalized fat phobia and I think and the fact that we do put a moral attribute on size we do it all the time we do it to food and we do it to body shape and I think when we can overcome that that's when we really begin to um experience what it is to be um, truly body neutral you know someone I have to check my own thin privilege I'm born genetically into a smaller body mm. despite my own history my own dis- body dysmorphia um you know I'm aware that I have that thin privilege and once you can bring an awareness to that I think you know it's it's yeah. powerful you begin to see it everywhere though don't you it's insidious. yeah yeah for sure I mean when I start when I do my workshops I'm really conscious of the fact that I'm I'm not in a larger body and I will always say and I'll always acknowledge the roots of the fat um the body positive um movement saying where it came from in the 1970s yeah. from the fat liberation movement and stuff I think that's really important to check your privilege that representation and, is so important um but yeah I think so I think one of the things I do share I think with with larger women is is being so tall I definitely have that 
I know what it feels like to like take up a lot of space. And I, it's funny, actually, when I stand next to someone who's really tall to me now, I do feel a little bit intimidated. And sometimes I do think sometimes it must be quite weird for men sometimes to stand next to a really tall woman and what that must feel like. I'm conscious that I take and it's a very unfeminine thing. And that's what I was conditioned to think it was unfeminine. So, yeah, there's anyway, I digress. But, yeah, it's it's really important. When a client come to you, and I'm not saying all our clients do, but how do you bring your non-diet approach to the work you do with um, the one-to-one clients with personal training? Okay, well, there's sort of two aspects to that as working as a um, fitness instructor, as a, just a recovering, um, coming from a recovered eating disorder perspective, is um, I do find diet talk and body talk around me quite difficult. The way I deal with when people talk about their diet, I just kind of just don't engage, like in a kind of really nonchalant kind of way I just try and sort of maybe change the subject or I'll skirt around it because um often yeah it's just all that talk you know my thighs are too big oh my god bingo wings and all of that and I just I just sort of try and focus I try and get steer them away from that and get them to focus on what they can achieve and what they're achieving with their bodies and one of the things I love doing is teaching um especially women how to lift weights because I just think it's so empowering or I love getting women doing stuff they thought they would never ever do like hoofing a log around a field you know when you see people doing stuff they just have never thought they'd ever do with their bodies I love that and I think weightlifting and teaching women how to weightlift and come and getting away from what you know their weight and and so I just try yeah. and bring like a more of a positive um, attitude to their bodies and just yeah and just not engage with the negative right. stuff in the fitness industry as a whole have you come across anything um in terms of mis- misunderstanding of what the body positivity movement is or intuitive eating mm-hmm. have you found any barriers to that um when you're trying to teach your classes or what you're doing online yeah there's a couple of things probably two things come to mind um one is intuitive eating you must hear this a lot as well Rosie people say if I just eat what I want I am just going to get so fat I'm just going to eat everything all the time I'm not going to stop eating and it's really hard to explain actually you know like imagine if you worked in a chocolate factory and you could eat as much chocolate as you like you know after a week of working there you are not going to want to eat a lot of chocolate and it's the same thing it's like if you give yourself permission to eat yeah what you want actually what happens the craving goes is the binge goes I mean since I started intuitive eating I, I can't remember the last time I bit and the second thing that comes to mind is um people there's been a lot of stuff on the internet that it's like um if you um it's the health stuff and and also thinking like you know that if you're allowing um larger women to just exist as or men in larger bodies you're promoting obesity and that just couldn't be further from from it at all it's um and it's just sadly kind of reflective of the fat phobic culture we live in really from well, my point of view from, the, from personal training and being in the industry for nine it's nearly 12 years now um it's same industry that a lot of people especially on social media will tell you it's okay to put a stick of butter in your cup of coffee in the morning and that's mm-hmm. healthy but um you can't have a bit of jam toast in the morning because that's the fact <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can't see how they compute that um which is funny how that happens yeah and i think rosie in terms of intuitive eating i remember probably a few months ago you did an instagram story um, and I've never really understood intuitive eating to be honest. I never looked into it until we framed him about, um, I mean, Rosie started talking about how we can try and help people. Um, a juice analogy of needing a wee. Um, in terms of, if I wanted a chocolate biscuit, I might, I might, I might butcher this, Rosie, but I try my best. <laughs> um, <laughs> just have it. You know, so it's like having a wee. You need to go for a wee, go for a wee. And someone's saying, no, you don't need a wee. As like a trainer, no, you don't need a wee. I know, but I really do need a wee. No, no, you don't need a wee. You don't need that chocolate biscuit. You can hold it. Okay, I'll hold it. And eventually, you go back and forth through this dialogue, and then you just wet the bed. <laughs> you've, you've held it in so long. You eat all the biscuits. I'll pack the biscuits, yeah. yeah. Rather than just going... That's a really good that analogy. Biscuit, you know, oh. and that's what I thought. I loved it. Um, and that's when it made it, it click for me in terms of, okay, it's not just about... Um, you can't tell someone just not eat the biscuit because it's not not going to happen unless you're there absolutely and I think it fosters a that kind of whole restrict deprive kind of cycle is where we actually end up having this very disordered relationship with food because then we just ping between kind of not eating denying to 
eating everything in, in sight. And that's partly psychological, but it's also partly physiological because we don't manage our blood sugar effectively throughout the day. We don't meet our nutrient energy needs. You know, you'll know yourself, Mel, that you know, when you don't do that, the your your rational brain plays no part mm. in the decision that gets made at the end of the day when all your body wants to do is get your blood sugar back up to like a safe level. So there's like that combination of physiological symptoms and also psychological symptoms. It's as this, you know, and you said yourself with that example of your um daughter going to the party and grabbing the biscuit and running off with it Mm. it's the same you know when we talk about fostering a healthy relationship with food in children and food neutrality if we take those foods off the pedestal if we can put them all on the same level playing field Mm. then they lose a lot of their power their alert definitely cornerstone of raising intuitive eaters is that children instinctively know you know if you put a selection of food in front of children they will normally put together quite a balanced plate of food Mm. if the conversation around that food has always been neutral but the minute we try and say eat your cucumber then you're allowed the biscuit we automatically create the cucumbers this duty food to be endured whereas if they're just all on the plate you know, the child may absolutely, your son did just didn't have the cucumber anyway. My children do the same. They'll come home from school. Sometimes they'll ask for a biscuit. Sometimes they'll make themselves a whole load of crudite and hummus. Sometimes they'll have a whole load of berries and yogurt because it's the mm-hmm. same. It's the same, yeah. you know. And I think, yeah, it's really, uh, but on that point, you know, in your experience as a mom, as your experience as someone working in the fitness industry, what do you? What are your biggest concerns for like the next generation? How do you think diet culture, you know, is gonna or can impact them? How do you think we can make a difference? Um, I just, I really worry. I suppose. I mean, the obvious one is social media, isn't it? Yeah. It's just, you know. Whereas, you know, when I was in my massive, what I thought was my massive body, because my my raging body dysmorphia when I was fifteen and living in in North Wales, um, I was living in the mountains. There was I think I'm just a teen magazine cat and that was mostly just like uh, boy bands you know it wasn't I wasn't seeing a lot of imagery and then I moved to London when I was 16 to live with my dad and suddenly there were billboards everywhere and it was um, the time of the Wonder Bra campaign which you're probably oh, too yeah. Yeah. young to no, remember no, no. but it no, was I'm like I'm not much younger than you Mel <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't it was like a big deal at the time wasn't it and like people were like crashing their cars because like there were all these supermodels these bras on and um <laughs> And then it was, and it was just everywhere. And it was like, and then all the Naomi Campbell and um, all of that lot. And because I was tall, it was always like, um, I was like, everyone was going on about how tall these women were. And I was like, well, I'm tall and I don't look like them. And I, that's when I started to question my appearance a lot, lot more. And that's when my relationship with my body took a real nosedive because I started comparing myself to these images I was constantly seeing. So when I think of kids now, they're getting it in their phone. When I was living in North Wales, if I was living there now, I would be getting it through my phone. There's no escape, like through Instagram and social media and stuff like that. And I think the comparison is a thief of joy. And it's so true. I would just be you know we compare ourselves we can't help comparing ourselves with with others so I really encourage my kids to come off social media as much as they can do both of them aren't on social media which is great they they are they are on social media my teenagers they do have Instagram accounts and Tumblr accounts but for their artwork um but they're still very much like you know my 16 year old came to me the other day just put a picture up and I didn't like you know there's still that approval seeking through social media still going on so, but it's really, yeah, I just think, God, these kids today, like they've just got no escape from it. It's going to be relentless. So I think the key is, I think, is just representation. We just need more diversity of represented bodies in our social media and in and in the national media, because the more, you know, like, so I, the more people that you can see with bodies like yours, like if Miranda had been around when I was younger, I just would have made such a difference to my life because yeah. like, I am basically like Miranda. And I think if she'd been around when I was younger, I would, oh, someone who's like me, or if I'd sort of got into rowing and a lot of the rowing women are really big and having role models is so important. So I'd say to anyone who's got kids whose body like isn't other or gender or anything like just find those role models that because they're just so important representation is like everything that's hugely hugely insightful and so true and I think the conversations I have with my children are very much around the same sort of things I try and expose them to a really diverse range of bodies but equally make them aware that what they see is really curated that is not real. That is photoshopped. That is filter after filter. That is fake tan. That is, you know, a whole load of 
you know, and how people hold themselves in images and how that's not a true image. And I try and talk about my own body. I don't try and talk about, I talk about my body in quite a neutral way around my mm. kids. So, you know, they'll say things like, oh, mummy, your tummy's so, it's all soft. I like putting my head in your tummy. Yeah, because that's where I grew my baby. That's where you were comfortable, you know, talking about it for what it delivers rather than what it looks like. So yeah, definitely yeah, with you, hundred percent yeah. there, hundred percent. Well, boys, from a male perspective, if you look at Captain America and Thor, well, when I was growing up, it was He-Man and Action Man, or the nineties wrestler like Hulk Hogan, who was I even named a dog after. <laughs> these, these, these people, like, I'm not, I'm not a big chap at all, but they were the guys I idled as a kid, and yeah. I think a lot of my issues started, and probably why I'm in the fitness industry, is because I was always trying to be. Hulk Hogan, <laughs> or like Bigger. Or, Bigger. or He-Man. I've, I've had my own issues with my my um my body in the past, and I've managed to get over them. But I've never really addressed it as as something, you know. I've just always been there, but I've never. Oh. I just thought I should gym culture man up. Get, mm. get Acknowledging the impact of it, sometimes yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. Acknowledging the impact of it and acknowledging what the actual deep problem was, rather than it's just um. I remember, like, I didn't go travelling as a teenager because I was so worried about missing a gym set, you know? Oh, I didn't want to... Jimmy! Well, to but, but, yeah, but that's... For me, I've never seen that as a as a problem. It's just like, uh, that's what I like doing. But when you unravel it and you start talking about this sort of thing, you can identify areas where you haven't done certain things and why your life's gone certain ways. And it's amazing how much something as simple as what is diet culture and online pressures can, can shape the way the way you live your life, you know. You don't, you know, yeah. I was oblivious to it until, until I. Actually, funny enough, interesting as a bit of as, as a bit of an experiment. I changed my gender on Facebook to male recently because I was just really sick of being advertised like period pants and just it was relentless. And I was like, I'm, I'm curious to see what men get advertised. So I changed my gender. And I was quite shocked, actually, at how much, obviously, it's a lot of shaving products, but there was, you know, all the guys and all the adverts have all got six packs as well, you know, all the pants the adverts and everything. And I was like, wow, if I was a bloke seeing all these images of guys, and I, I would be affected by that too. You just, you just mm. can't escape from it. Dieting makes you, you feel like you failed, like, so the fault is yours. You don't have enough willpower when actually the problem is out in the world. It's not you. It's, it's out, the whole system is designed to not for your genuine well-being it's just designed to make money so the lives we can lead when we um, manage to unhook and unchain from that um the, how fulfilling our lives can be the stuff we can actually concentrate on because we're not focused on dieting is is incredible i've seen um huge changes in people who've been able to just finally and i'm sure you have mel in your work unhook you know um, mel just to wrap it up then um, off the back of that, if you could have access to a big billboard and on that billboard you could put um, a big message for everyone to see, the whole world would see this billboard, what would you build it? I just to say something like you are, something like um, be kind or like you are so much more than your body. Like that would be my big message. Like just like you were saying, Rosie, um, we, we are so much more than our bodies. We've got so much more to offer. And um, if we can get outside of our of that thinking that our bodies are the most important thing, think of the things that you can achieve. Think of the things, the changes we could make in the world. Think of how much better our relationships would be, our work, our families, everything, money. Um, yeah, we, just, we are so much more than our bodies. You are so much more than your body. If everyone drove to work with that thought in their minds every day, what a different world it would be now, eh? Yeah. Definitely. Oh, well, thank you so much for your time today, Jimmy, and I really appreciate it. I think um, the work you're doing in the body positivity space is incredible and it's amazing to meet another energy who gets it and wants to send that message out. And I always use the analogy of gathering whispers because diet culture is such a huge voice. I always think of it like a storm. But I think the more whispers we can gather will one day we're gonna have a roar and we're gonna be able to take it down sorry how can our members find you so if they want to look up to you um look up you up or go on your oh, website yeah, um, or i mean that? if they want to at the minute i'm really literally all i'm using the page for is just to I repost a lot of stuff because i'm quite busy at the minute but um just reposting a lot anything that i see that's interesting to do with fat phobia or um body positivity like inspiration interesting articles and things like that um it's just uh if you just 
uh, search Body Positive Cornwall. I'm on Facebook and on Instagram, but so I haven't, I have not been particularly busy on both of those at the minute, but um, I will be advertising my workshops on there. So, um, which are all based in Truro. So if anyone is around in Cornwall, if you have any clients raised in Truro um, or around Cornwall that um, would want to come to those, then yeah, then just get in touch. Because obviously after all of this is over, I'll be back hopefully doing some workshops and, um, and or maybe I'll have to do them online. I don't know at the minute, but. Yeah, if you, you want to find out, just, yeah, go and find the page. Thank you for tuning in. And we hope you have taken something away from listening. Perhaps one small action you can put into practice today. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. So pop on over to Reframe Club where you can share them, your own reflections and experiences. We would love to hear from you. As always, here at Reframe Club, we are rooting for you.